You have to go to the ends of the Earth in order to leave the Earth. Since the space shuttles were retired in 2011, we've depended on the Russians to launch us into space, and we must start with a journey to the Baikonur Cosmodrome on the desert steppes of Kazakhstan. First, I fly from Houston to Moscow, a familiar journey of 11 hours, and from there I ride in a van to Star City, Russia, 45 miles away, anywhere from one to four hours, depending on Moscow traffic. Star City is the Russian equivalent of the Johnson Space Center. It's the place where the cosmonauts have been trained for the last 50 years. And, more recently, the astronauts who will travel to space with them. Star City is a town with its own mayor and a church, museums, and apartment blocks. There's a giant statue of Yuri Gagarin, who became the first human in space in 1961, taking a simple, humble, socialist realist step forward while holding a bouquet of flowers behind his back. Years ago, the Russian space agency built a row of townhouses especially for us Americans, and staying in them is sort of like staying in a movie set based on a Russian stereotype of how Americans live. There are huge fridges and huge TVs, but somehow everything is slightly off. I've spent a lot of time in Star City, including serving as NASA's director of operations there, but it still feels foreign to me, especially in the heart of the frozen Russian winter. After a few weeks of training, I find myself longing to head back to Houston. From Star City, we fly 1,600 miles to Baikonur, once the secret launch site for the Soviet space program. People sometimes say that a place is in the middle of nowhere, but I never say that anymore unless I'm talking about Baikonur. The launch site was actually built in a village called Turatam, named for a descendant of Genghis Khan, but was referred to as Baikonur, the name of another town several hundred miles away as subterfuge. Now this is the only place called Baikonur. Early on, the Soviets also referred to their launch facility as Star City so as to further confuse the United States. For an American who grew up and trained as a Navy pilot during the tail end of the Cold War, it will always feel a bit strange that I'm invited into the epicenter of the former Soviet space program to be taught its secrets. The people who live in Baikonur now are mostly Kazakh, descendants of Turkic and Mongol tribes, with a minority of ethnic Russians who were left behind after the breakup of the Soviet Union. Russia leases the facilities here from Kazakhstan. The Russian ruble is the main currency, and all the vehicles have Russian license plates. From the air, Baikonur seems to have been flung randomly into the high desert steppes. It's a strange collection of ugly concrete buildings, horribly hot in summer and harshly cold in winter, with mounds of rusting, disused machinery piled everywhere. Packs of wild dogs and camels scrounge in the shadows of aerospace equipment. It's a desolate and brutal place, and it's the only working human spaceport for most of the world. I'm descending towards Baikonur in a Tupolev 134, an old Russian military transport plane. This aircraft might once have been outfitted with bomb racks and in a pinch could have served as a bomber, part of the Cold War arsenal the Soviets developed with the purpose of attacking my country. But now it's used to transport international crews of space travelers, Russian, American, European, Japanese, and Canadian. We are former enemies remade as crewmates on our way to the space station we built together.